Hi, I'm Jeremy Sherman. And for 27 years, I've studied and collaborated closely with UC Berkeley biologist Terence Deacon with a focus on making his explanations more accessible. Here is an interpretation I draw from our work. There's a simple yet humongous question that scientists have yet to answer, let alone hardly address, though Deacon does. By the end of this video, you'll have a strictly scientific yet overlooked hunch about how to answer it. Ready? Here's the question. How does mattering emerge from matter? What happens matters to you, right? Nothing matters to a star, stone, molecule, atom, or quark. Nothing matters to the individual bits of matter in you either. Not even to a DNA molecule. We're made of matter, but nothing matters to it. So super simple question. How does mattering emerge from matter? Or to put it another way, what happens matters to living beings, not to inanimate matter. Even a microbe, fungus, or tree, having no feelings or thoughts, is struggling for its existence, trying to stay alive, trying to keep being a being, because it matters to them. What happens matters to a tree. How do beings for whom things matter emerge from nothing but matter? This question, in so many words, has been around for millennia, and the religious and spiritual have an answer. Everything matters to some supreme being, force, or entity. We don't have to explain how matter emerged from matter. It all matters to something supernatural. Well, science is a campaign to find natural explanations for all natural phenomena. So scientists can't claim some supernatural answer. Still, they mostly sidestep the question. They remind me of dejected lovers. They proposed a marriage between matter and mattering, but never heard back from nature. So they'd rather not talk about it, not revisit that old wound. Scientists have three main ways to change the subject. How did mattering emerge from matter? It's the wrong question because mattering is just another way of describing what matter does. When DNA replicates, it's selfishly trying to replicate. When natural selection selects, it's nature, but it's like a supreme being selecting the best. This is called panpsychism. Stuff matters to all matter. How did mattering emerge from matter? It's a wrong question because mattering is just a figment of our imaginations. All we are is matter. This is called material eliminativism. Eliminate mattering since matter is all there is. How did mattering emerge from matter? It's the wrong question because it's unanswerable and it doesn't matter. Just assume that there's both matter and mattering. This is called mysterianism. Leave the mystery alone. It's unsolvable, and anyway, it doesn't matter. These are sometimes accompanied by a critique of supernatural answers. Like, at least these answers are not as ridiculous as that supernatural stuff. Okay, so here's the overlooked scientific hunch for how mattering emerged from matter. First, there are spaces between matter, right? And they change as matter moves around. Those spaces are natural and have consequences for what is likely and unlikely to happen. Water is less likely to flow through a stone wall of densely packed molecules. It tends to flow down paths of less resistance around it. There are paths of relatively less and more resistance, and they change over time as matter moves around. For example, when ice melts, other matter is more likely to pass through the resulting water or steam. So it is the wrong question after all. Mattering doesn't emerge from matter. It emerges within nature, which includes changes in likely flows, depending on relative concentrations. Scientists refer to paths of more resistance as constraints. It's a useful term, but since it's a noun, it suggests solids like walls, absolute blockages. Not all constraints are solids. Take traffic congestion. It's a fluid constraint. You could flow through it. You're just unlikely to if there are detours of relatively less resistance. Still, the question remains, how does mattering emerge within nature? Maybe this is getting a little boring. Maybe you'll change the channel because you've got better things to do, things that matter more to you. Ideas can become as hard to get through as traffic congestion. People take detours around them, the way some researchers would rather not talk about this or that because they found a way to sidestep it. Still, we're not like water flowing down any old path of least resistance. 
We got things to do, places to go, and flows to avoid, even if they're easier paths of least resistance. Because what matters to you, you impose some self-discipline, self-control, self-constraint, agency, willpower. You focus on what matters to you instead of just dithering down any path of least resistance. Staying alive matters most to you, as it does to all living beings, even the ones that don't feel or think. Like them, you use your self-control today, your self-constraint today, to make unlikely your own death. For example, doing whatever works keeps health and money flowing your way. And you do it by making other work unlikely. If you're trying to keep from boozing and eating yourself to death, you'll use your willpower to impose some won't power, keeping a gallon of whiskey and a Costco tub of chocolates off your desk. Your self-control is the hunch, at least for me. Here's what I've come to think I am. I'm a self-regenerative unlikelification. Like all organisms, I struggle for my existence by continuously making my non-existence unlikely. I'm a fluid constraint comprised of myriad fluid constraints pitted against each other like checks and balances. But overall, living, not dead, I'm a fluid constraint that channels energy and matter into effort to prevent the degeneration of the fluid constraint I am. That's my number one to don't. I'm a fluid constraint that prevents my death today so that I can continue to prevent my death tomorrow. On and on until I can't it anymore, at which point the last matter in me will continue moving around, but dithering since nothing matters to it. Researchers are often vague about what must be explained in the transition from matter to mattering. Is it DNA or RNA replication? Is it consciousness, feeling, free will, self-awareness? I say the challenge is explaining the emergence of self struggling for their own existence. Once you have chemical unlikelification that prevents its own ending, that's the origins of self struggling for their own existence. It may not seem like much, but that's where it would start, the emergence of self-regenerative unlikelification, of not just dithering down paths of least resistance. Some researchers argue that order is the origin of mattering. Take a whirlpool, for example. It's the spontaneous ordering of turbulent water flows, the emergence of an orderly spiral path of least resistance. But such self-organizing systems do nothing to regenerate themselves. Since as far back as the Egyptians channeling the Nile for irrigation, we've been engineering paths of relatively less resistance through paths of relatively more resistance. Engineers are master flow wranglers, but their flows aren't regenerating themselves the way we are. A river does nothing to regenerate itself, and neither does our highest tech gadget made of durable parts, solid constraints that prevent some flows, allowing for others. Nothing matters to a supercomputer because it's not struggling for its own existence. How then does mattering emerge within nothing but nature's changing paths of relatively more or less resistance? It would start much simpler than us, way simpler than even the simplest known single-cell organism. In the next video, I offer my interpretation of Deacon's scientific explanation for how mattering emerges within nature.